So you all know me by now, Mary Ellen Beattie with uh, the Franklin Center. I want to dive right in here. I'm um, going to do a lecture on strategic research, how to vet public figures. Um, you could also call this opposition research, but um, I think for today's sake, we're going to call it strategic. Um, I really like what Yael said in his session earlier today when he said, you know, who am I? I'm just a guy with a computer. And I want to show you all just how powerful you can be by being that guy with a computer. Uh, there is so much information out there today on organizations, people, um, money trails, and the relationships between people and organizations. And I want to give you some tools to help you get started so that you can better vet public figures, organizations, candidates. Because let's be honest, um, if we're only listening to the PR spin that we get from particular organizations or from particular candidates, we're not going to learn a whole lot. We're not going to get the truth. Um, and so we've really got to dig down deep, and it's us to, up to us to do the research. Now, at this point, I'm a little bit of a research nerd. I, I may or may not have spent a few Saturday nights at home with my laptop and a glass of wine. <laughs> And, uh, and as you go along, you will find that there, you just get off on these little rabbit holes that you just keep clicking and you keep clicking and you'll start off with one question and, and suddenly two hours later you end up uh, at a completely different conclusion. So um, I just say that to say that you know, if you're looking for the answer to one specific question, you may not be able to find it, um, but there certainly are, are, are lots of tools out there and I wanna go through, through some of them. Um, the reason why I think it's so important to do strategic research is that we need to hold people accountable. And you keep hearing that today over and over and over, is we need to, we need to hold folks accountable. Uh, but even one step further, we need to make them live up to their own standards. Because every day we have public figures who stand up and they tell us how to live our lives. They tell us how to educate our kids. They tell us how to spend our money. They even tell us what kind of foods we can and can't eat. They might not be happy about my coffee and cookie break that I had earlier, um, but they do. And, and you know, I'm not an anarchist. I think that there's certainly value in having laws in our society, but what really irks me is that when they, here they are trying to push all these laws upon us and they don't even live up to those standards in their personal lives. That bothers me. Um, you know, I think people have a sense of fairness in America, you know, they just, you know, you know, they want things to be fair. That's why when we talk about, you know, uh, election integrity today and we talk about, you know, how, you know, we don't want, we want to expose voter fraud. Part of that is because we want a fair system. We want to know that our voices have been heard. And, and there's just this, when we see hypocrisy in society, it bothers us. It gets under our skin. Uh, and I, th I think particularly for Americans. And so when we see these public officials who come and tell us how we need to live our lives, and then they go and they live a completely different way, it bothers us. And so that's the biggest thing is we need to make them live up to their own standards and expose the hypocrisy. Um, the first way to do that, I would say, is to start thinking with a document state of mind, okay? Pretty much every decision that's made in government there is a document to back it up, which is great. <laughs> Anytime uh, somebody makes a, a claim to you or they, they, they say that they have the inside scoop and maybe you're a little skeptical and maybe you're wondering, okay, where, where did they get that information? My first response is always, show me the document because pretty much there's a document for everything these days. You could click. Here's my little document picture. Um, but yeah, and most citizens don't think like this. You know, we're not a part of the government bureaucracy. You know, we, we follow what's happening in our community and we follow when, you know, there's a new road, you know, there's um, a construction project happening in our community. We follow when, you know, the public school system has a new addition. But what you don't know is that all of those decisions were made by someone and there's a document to back it up. So it's, it's really starting to think, you know, you're born. There's a document. You have a birth certificate. You buy property. There's a document to back that up. You pay your taxes. There's a document to back it up. And like I said, when you get into the government, it's even more detailed. They have memos. They have briefings. They have proposals for a proposal. And you can get your hands on these as a citizen. 
So I know Jerry went into a little bit of that today, which is great, um, but too many citizens that I know don't take advantage of open records requests. How many people in the room have, have made an open records request? Any, okay, good, we've got, wow, that's more hands than I usually see. So thank you for, for being proactive there. Um, part of doing strategic research, thinking like an investigative reporter, um, it starts with the way you think. You know, you have to ask questions. You know, so many people have been saying, question the narrative. Uh, and that's, that's really where it starts. It's just your neighbors and friends kind of gathering around and say, you know, on my way to, my usual route to work, I noticed there's this new construction project going up and I wonder what they're building. And even further, I wonder who's funding that. Is that coming out of our taxpayer dollars? What is that? And so often we drive by and we just keep going. Oh, huh, I'll wait, I'll wait and see what the newspaper says. You know, but we can't wait anymore. We gotta pursue that and find out, you know, is that a stimulus project that's being worked on in your local community? That's, I mean, that's a whole nother story right there. You know, let's say you happen to be, you know, driving along Main Street and you notice that the name of a building changed. Oh, it could, let's say it's an academic building at a university. Oh, I know it used to be the John Smith Building for Economics and now, huh, now it's, you know, the Tom Jones Building for Economics, huh. They change the name. And again, people keep walking. But we've got to you know, train ourselves to think differently and say, why did the name of that building change? And who, who is this Tom Jones guy? <laughs> is he an alumni of the organization? Did he give a lot of money? Where, where does he get his money? Um, is it family money? You know, how, how did he earn that? So again, you can get off on these rabbit trails, like I said, here I am already getting on imaginary rabbit trails and, and these scenarios don't even exist, but it's so easy and we need to just train ourselves to ask these questions, um, to know when something doesn't smell right. Um, we, we do online webinars at the Franklin Center and recently we did uh, a webinar with Katie Pavlich through Town Hall and I know we've mentioned her earlier today. Um, she is, is one who really, pursued the Fast and Furious case and she wouldn't let the story die. And one of the citizens asked on this online webinar, you know, well, you know, Katie, what, what made you think to pursue this story? What, you know, what made you even think that it was worth talking about or that anybody would care? And she just said, well, you know, it just, and, and, and this seems like such a simple answer from a very intelligent woman who now has a New York Times uh, best-selling book. She just said, it just didn't seem right to me. She said, here we have Brian Terry, an American citizen, a US border agent who died on American soil because by guns that the US government allowed on, on our soil. She's like, it, it just didn't seem right to me. Um, and so that's how I really think a lot of your stories are gonna start, is you're in your local communities and you ask yourselves, huh, w what is going on down at the, at the school system? What, why is there a referendum this year? I thought, I thought we just had a referendum like four years ago and they told us that that was gonna solve all of our problems. That was gonna save our kids art programs and music programs. And now four years later, we have another one? Huh, well what happened to that money? That's an interesting question. Um, so again, it's just training yourself to always be aware of what's happening in your communities and, and going the next step and, uh, and, and investigating. So the first thing I always tell everyone to do, let's, now let's switch gears here and say we're talking about a person. You've got someone in mind that you want to vet. Maybe it's a candidate, you know, maybe it's just a local businessman who's got a lot of ties in your community and you think, who is this guy? Uh, the first thing you should do is kind of, you know, a brain dump. Everything that you know about this person, write down on paper or maybe just have a conversation with a friend. What, what do we know about this guy? You know, is he married? Uh, has, he, has he been previously divorced, maybe? Is he a parent? You know, who are his children and how old are they and, and where do they go to school? Um, is this person a lawyer? If so, where did he go to law school? These are very, very basic questions, but you just have to start thinking, what do I know this person, about this person? Um, do they have a military service record? If so, where did they serve and when? Um, is this a businessman and has he owned businesses in maybe another community outside of my own? So these are just questions. Is he a college graduate? If so, where did he go to school? 
Who did he study under? Who were his mentors? Um, this might sound a little silly. Is this, is this guy a sportsman? Is he a gun nut? Does he own guns? And, and there's a document for that too, um, for people who own firearms. So these, these are just, just basic questions that, that you can follow up on. And, and let me be clear, we're not, we're not digging to you know, ruin people's lives here. You know, we're certainly, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, and I do wanna say that. Um, it's important to vet people and call them out when they are being hypocrites, when they're not living up to their own standards. If they're just good, decent people, you know, they're good, decent people. But I do think that it's important that we vet them thoroughly. Um, so that's my little disclaimer. Don't go out, <laughs> don't go out uh, you know, burning, burning bridges and, and things like that. Okay. Sure. Oh, we're going to get there. Oh, you're, he's ahead of me. He's ahead of, he's ahead of me. Um, yes, somebody who runs for president is obviously in the national spotlight. And um, in Obama's case, he started campaigning very early, which, you know, just from a, a political mindset, I thought, huh, because he joined the, he announced his candidacy so early, I said, that leaves more time for him to get attacked in the media, right? That's a political strategy. You time when you enter the race and that, and, and that really wasn't the case. You know, he was the media darling from the beginning and, and, um, and we really didn't see a, a very thorough vetting process. We'll get there. So next click, uh, this is so basic, but does, does everybody in the room know what a, a Google alert is? I won't go through this too extensively. I know um, Yale mentioned this in his lecture also, um, but I just want to, if you'd click the, the underlined Google Alert part. Sorry, guys. I do just want to just really quickly show you how this operates. You go to google.com slash alerts, and what this allows you to do is you can name, let's say you want to follow everything that's happening on a piece of legislation. You're really interested in a local tax, you know, whatever, a proposal that's happening in your county. You can create a Google alert on the name of that piece of legislation or the name of that person, the name of that organization. Let's say, for example, you thought Franklin Center was kind of shady and you wanted to research this, this mysterious Franklin Center. You could create a Google alert. Um, it's here you go, you search query, and it's got result type. So click on the where it says result type everything on the left, scroll down. You can say, what do you want? Do I just want news about the Franklin Center? Do I want only blog posts about the Franklin Center? And I kind of want to see what blogs are saying, any videos that we do, um, or you can select all. I want everything. Anything that's on the internet about the Franklin Center, I want it all, you know? And then some people say, okay, well, that's way too much information. I get a lot of emails. I get a lot of spam. So, you know, how, how can we minimize that? So you can select that you want this news as it happens, which means the second a story is posted online that says Franklin Center, you will immediately be emailed. Um, or you can get it once a day, which just means at the end of the day, you will receive an email that has links to all of the articles that mention Franklin Center. And again, you could do this with anything. You could do this with a, a, a candidate or a person who is um, running, you know, running for office or maybe someone who's already in office and you just kind of want to track what's happening. I think this works really well when you're curious about, again, a piece of legislation and you want to know what people are saying about it. Um, sometimes I just, I'll set up um, like, you know, cap and trade. I was really interested in, in what citizens thought about cap and trade, you know, how they perceived the piece of legislation. And so I, you know, had a Google alert on cap and trade for a while, which let me tell you was a lot of email in my inbox, but I was just curious as to, I was curious about what citizens thought. So anyways, I just wanted to show you how easy this is. Google, google.com slash alerts, you can set up a Google alert on anyone. And I highly, highly, highly recommend that you set up a Google alert on yourself. So you may think, oh, I'm no one important, like who cares? But uh, you'd be amazed how much information is, is out there about you on the internet, as you will see. And, um, <laughs> and so I, I would recommend that you start a Google alert on yourself. And if for some reason there's some, some weird information out there about you or you know, someone who tries to corner you at one of these events and, and catch you saying something silly, you know that it's out there and you're able to kind of run interference there. So um, yes, I've gotten very good at researching people. It's, it's to the point now where I have friends who will say, oh, Mary Ellen, you know, I'm dating this new guy. Can I give you his name? <laughs> and then I'll kind of, you know, go and see what I can find out about him online. So it can be fun. 
Um, we have to have fun in the movement, right? Like, because politics is sometimes too serious, and we do need to, we need to have fun. So anyways, we're going we're gonna to keep rolling. Uh, friends and allies. You want to think to yourself, who is this person closely associated with? Who are their friends? Um, my grandmother always had a quote that she a saying that, that she said to me, and it was, you become like those around you, so choose your friends wisely. And I never forgot that saying, because I, I, I just do think it is telling. But anyways, um, so, so we want to take a look at, at who are their friends and who are their allies. Um, obviously, you can all see the, the picture up here. Um, Obama hanging out with, uh, <laughs> with his old uh, pastor or preacher, Jeremiah Wright. Now, the gentleman over here had mentioned, you know, why, why didn't we um, more closely vet President Obama? And I think, obviously, this was a news story for a while. Um, you all know um, Obama's old preacher, uh, Jeremiah Wright, who had some, some pretty radical things to say about America. Uh, in one case, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking lightly, in one place he said, you know, we shouldn't say God bless America, we should say God, excuse me, damn America. And, um, and, and Obama said that this man was like a father to him. He said that, you know, he was a mentor to him. Those are strong words. And I think that we, we should deserve to know something about this man and what his views are on America, on a free market society, um, on, uh, on capitalism in general. And so I really do believe that, that we dropped this story too early. And I think, um, I think Americans were afraid of being called racist, uh, and they stopped, and they pretty much just dropped the story. And I know we've had other people, other speakers today, talk about this, how, you know, um, certain parties will use this as a tactic, is they will call people racist sometimes because it's the only argument they have left against you. Uh, and, and I really do feel that, you know, maybe if, if we had vetted him more thoroughly, um, this would have been a bigger story than it really was in 2008. And then, of course, you all know before um, Andrew Breitbart passed away, he was working on a story where he uncovered um, the Harvard professor that President Obama was close with, uh, Derek Bell, who believed very strongly in critical race theory. And I'm not gonna go into the, the details and logistics of critical race theory up here today, but it has some very strong implications about the laws of America and what their intentions and their purposes are for. And again, you know, uh, Obama himself supported critical race theory and, he, and um, he considered this man, Derek Bell, a mentor of his. I think that information is important for us to know um, you know, who were his uh, ideological heroes and in, in his academic um, background. We won't click to Wikipedia because everybody knows Wikipedia. But what you don't know about it is if you, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of whoever, let's say you were to look, actually, okay, let's do it. Let's, sorry. <laughs> let's click Wikipedia. Let's type in Eric Holder. I think a C, yeah. <laughs> so there's gonna be a ton of information about him. Obviously, it's a good place to start, but, and, and I, I don't think that Wikipedia is always um, objective either, by the way. But if you scroll all the way down, keep scrolling, keep scrolling, there's a whole list of references. Check that out, almost over 60 already. And, and this is a good place for you to start. If you're researching someone who has a more national profile, these are articles and essays and stories, and the research is already done for you. So I point this out as an easy start. Easy start. People overlook Wikipedia, but I think these references are great. Even if you don't like what Wikipedia says about the person in the first paragraph, maybe, those references are going to give you other examples of, what pe of, of who this person is. Um, the next resource, you can click back, it's called Facebook Search. Oh, you're going to love this. This is going to change your world. This is not Facebook. This is Facebook Search, okay? And, um, and basically, you can look up keywords and find out what people are saying on Facebook about a particular issue. So, for example, let's put in, um, like, Auburn shooting. You know, if we just wanted to find out what are people saying on Facebook about the Colorado shooting that recently happened. And here it'll pull up for you. It'll pull up all these people 
you know, what their opinions are, if they posted an article about it or a story. This is great for reporters or for bloggers who are looking for sources. Again, let's say there's a local, um, uh, a local tax that's happening or a local proposition and you're looking, you wanna find a really opinionated person to interview, you can go and write in the name of that proposition or whatever it is and you can find great sources this way. Oh, oh, here we go, she's getting creative. Okay, so no one's talking about the Boca Raton water rate, but put in uh, Occupy DC. I did a lot of, I had a lot of fun with Facebook search um, when I wanted my interns to go out and kind of find out what was happening in the Occupy movement in DC, and I wanted them to go get some video footage, so like what is actually going on at these rallies, and what are these people, what do they stand for, go get some interviews, let's talk to them, let's find out. And it was so easy, I just clicked Occupy DC and pulled this up on Facebook search and I had all the information I needed to know when their events were, when they were hosting rallies. Um, you know, you can see people who are, you, you find all the advocates, right? Because when people are trying to recruit for a cause or for an event, they post it on Facebook. And so you can very easily um, find information, again, about, you can find sources on, you know, uh, local legislation on, on particular movements. The day of the healthcare decision, uh, I went ahead and typed in a few keywords related to um, the healthcare decision, and that was very interesting to me. I, I just, I really like people, and I like how they think, and I want to know what people are thinking. So that was how I researched public opinion about. And, and okay, and it's not everybody's on Facebook, so it's not foolproof, but if you're kind of, you wanna gauge the pulse of America, like, well, what are people thinking about a particular issue? I think this is a good way to kind of see the, see the two extremes and find out where, where people are at. Okay, Facebook search, very fun. Question? You do not have to be on Facebook. You do not have to be on Facebook, so. Um, all right. We'll keep moving on here. Uh, lifestyle, do they practice what they pe preach? Now, personally, um, you know, we could all have a conversation about how much a person's personal life has to do with, you know, their political life, if they're gonna run for office, for example. Uh, for example, let's say this person is very family oriented and they've plastered on their, their campaign literature pictures of themselves with their family and their happy, you know, their spouse and their children. And then we come to find out, you know, that maybe they were a little promiscuous a year or two prior. Um, again, you know, we can have an argument about whether that really matters on their political career, but to me, it's holding them accountable. If he says he's a family man and he says those values are important to him, we want to make sure that that's true. He just wants two <laughs> <laughs> you could say the same about, um, you know, maybe their their income. You know, are they a person who maybe talks about how we need to be more charitable and, you know, people who make a certain amount of money are greedy and they need to give more money to those who are less fortunate. And then we come to find out that this person has a very lavish lifestyle with two vacation homes. That's a problem for me as a citizen. You know, I have a problem with that. So um, the example that I have up here is good old Al Gore. We haven't heard much from him lately. <laughs> but, um, you know, he was preaching energy efficiency nonstop. I mean, that was, that was what he was known for. And he wanted us to change the light bulbs we use. And he wanted us to, you know, um, to change, you know, the way that we, you know, water consumption and energy consumption and, and a lot of things about our personal lives. And if we make those personal decisions, that's great. But he wanted to regulate this uh, and force this upon us by law. And sure enough, we come to find out that um, he was spending $30,000 a year in utility bills on his vacation home in Tennessee. Actually, that was a Franklin Center news story that exposed that, which I'm very, very, very proud of. Um, although I didn't write it, but I'm still proud because <laughs> I work here. But, and then uh, the carbon emission level was 20 times more than the average household. And it's stuff like that that just really bugs us. How are you gonna tell us that when we're scraping our pennies to try to do everything we can, um, you know, to put food on the table and to pay for gas, and here he is, um, you know, he's got a utility bill that's through the roof. So um, you wanna look at the, at the person's lifestyle and make sure it matches up with what they're preaching. Uh, next, 
education and credibility. Um, where did this person go to school? Who were their professors? What did they study? Um, I think too often we just take people at their word when they tell us what they majored in and where they went to school. Believe it or not, people uh, actually exaggerate this quite a bit. Or sometimes they um, have a job with a, a, an expertise level of something they never actually really went to school for. Um, so it's something to look at. Again, sometimes it's nothing. Uh, but, but I think education and credibility is at least worth giving a look at. Look at um, any papers or theses that they may have written. That sometimes give you, uh, gives you really good insight. Uh, I, I was at Marquette University, and, and one little, I did lots of, you know, Nancy Drew kind of sleuth projects while, while I was there, and one thing I did was I looked at, you know, very, um, you know, liberal theology professors who were also Jesuits to find out what their theses were about to see, you know, did it match up with the Catholic teachings at the university, and that was an interesting study. Um, you want to find out what groups were they a part of when they were at college, you know, um, were they a part of any political groups, did they attend any political rallies, um, you know, did they, did they have any volunteer work, if so, where. Uh, you want to verify dates uh, and degrees, uh, so you can click on the education link here. There's a website called studentclearinghouse.org, uh, and they will verify dates for you of when a person was at a particular university, what they majored in. Oh, that's right. And you had a website that you were going to tell us to. What's the name of it? Go.com for vetting. Okay. Come see him afterward. He's got another great website, too. Um, and, and sometimes the dates matter, like for example, you know, maybe someone took a year off of school, like if you look at the dates and the dates don't match up and you think, okay, well that person took a year off of school, and it might be nothing. It might be that their mother was sick and they took a year off school to take care of their sick mother, you know, and it might be that, you know, they had a, an injury and they took a year off to, you know, to get better. But maybe it's something else. Maybe they ran into legal trouble and had trouble with the law, and they had to take a year off school to take care of that. I mean, these are just questions that, that you want to start building as you're researching, uh, particularly with education. There's a lot of information that you can find there. We're going to keep rolling. I got, what, 15 minutes? Okay. Uh, family background. Are they who they say they are? Uh, in this case, we're talking about ethnic background. Um, here we have Elizabeth Warren. Candidate for U.S. Senate in where um, Massachusetts. Um, Guy Benson, who was our lunch speaker today, covered this story quite thoroughly. So if you're interested in learning more about what, what I'm about to talk about, you know, Google Guy Benson and um, Elizabeth Warren. So basically, when she was at Harvard Law School, she claimed um, her heritage as Native American, and this is self-identified. So the school didn't call her Native American. She checked the little box. She checked the bubble, you know, Native American. And I think Cherokee, I believe, was the tribe that she had a claim to. And, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the news. It wasn't, you know, a political group trying to attack her. It was the Cherokee tribe themselves who first initiated this battle and said, that's really interesting. C can you prove that? And um, and I'm sure no one had ever asked her to, to prove her family background because if somebody tells you they are what they are, I mean, it's almost insulting to, um, to question that. But they did. And um, it turned out she had a whole a very, very strange reasoning as to why she thought her family heritage was Native American. And, and, and I don't, I don't want to you know, um, speak on her behalf. Maybe there was some confusion in their family history, and that happens. But... Uh, you know, some could argue that she was using that to exploit her status in at Harvard Law School and potentially using that to, you know, um, further her political career. And so if that's the case, that matters to me as a citizen. I mean, you all have to find out what matters to you as a citizen, but lying about your family background, using your ethnic background to try to advance your political career, that's a problem for me as a citizen. Did you have a question, Jerry? Is that the one that the Republican Party sent Yes. Yeah, okay. You got it. 
I won't go into her crazy reasonings, but you gotta Google this. You gotta look it up. And she was talking about how Native Americans have high cheekbones and her great grandfather, they have a picture of him and he had very high cheekbones just like the Native Americans. And that's, that's so crazy. That's just, that's not even, I don't know how that's the basis for your family history. And she went on to talk about a few family recipes that had been passed down. And there's just, uh, yeah, there's no real way to verify that, that she has any, any Cherokee heritage. Do you have a comment, Rich? Well, does everybody know about the stolen valor law that was brought down by the Supreme Court? Yes. Okay, okay we'll keep going because I want to try to get through the rest of this. It's legal. Yeah. Well, military. Um, military record. Um, where did they serve? You all know, you remember when the Swift Boat veterans um, uncovered John Kerry's real military history. And again, you know, we, we honor and support all the soldiers who serve, no matter in what capacity or rank that they serve in. But again, if they're using it to advance their political career and they're exaggerating their involvement, that's a problem for me. Um, so I encourage you to look up military record. We're going to skip that website. Um, ch -ch -ch. Favoritism. Do they make exceptions for some and not for others? So you all remember when Obama was campaigning and one of his big campaign speeches was he said, super PACs inhibit democracy. You know, I mean, he said that over and over and over and you know, he was not going to you know, give in to the special interests and the super PACs. Okay, you know, that's a, you know, I think that's a, a good thing to say. Um, and yet, when we FOIA'd the White House visitor logs, and did you all know that, that um, the White House visitor logs are posted on the White House website? Yes. Um, this used to be information you had to file um, a FOIA request a freedom of inform from, with the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, but actually, the Obama administration, and I do give him credit for this, uh, in his attempt at um, his commitment to transparency, he now posts the White House visitor log on the White House website. So this information is available to you on the White House website, and I just wanted to pull that up so you can see who he's been hanging out with. Um, but my point is, so when, when they originally, reporters went and filed a, a FOIA request and they wanted to say, oh, who's been coming to visit you lately at the White House, President Obama? Um, and it was, of course, several of Obama's top donors. Uh, they were on the White House guest list regularly which is fine, he can invite whoever he wants, but do you or I have access like that to the president? No, we surely don't. What's the price tag? How, how much money do we have to give so that we could have access to the president? And again, there's nothing illegal about that, there's nothing wrong with that, the president can invite whoever he wants, but if he's going to say super PACs inhibit democracy and I'm not gonna play that game, then here he is, we need to hold him up to his own standards and say, if that's what you believe, then you shouldn't be inviting these folks to the White House regularly. Um, I want to tell a quick story, uh, another story about favoritism. This is great. This comes from one of our citizen watchdog trainings. I had a, uh, a citizen tell me that, that he was really upset about, this is, sounds so silly, but um, he thought there was corruption in uh, with parking tickets in his local town. And this was a small town, oh my word. And he just said, you know what? There's never anywhere to park when I go downtown to the post office or when I go to the city council. There's never anywhere to park. And everybody knows it's because, you know, the law enforcement is, is sh they're playing favorites and, you know, they're excusing parking tickets for all their buddies, for family members of law enforcement, maybe for people who, you know, politicians who were very friendly and encouraging to law enforcement. I said, you know, that's an interesting story. You should file a, uh, an open records request. And he didn't even know that he could do that. So he did, he requested the records of excused parking tickets in his town. And when he got the list, sure enough, there were repeat offenders. There were names that appeared on almost a weekly basis. They were having their parking tickets excused. And so, I mean, for him, that was a victory. We talk about, you know, Jerry talks about getting involved locally in your community, and you might not be able, you know, to change the world, but you can make a difference in your little local community. For him, that was huge. In his town, everybody talked about that. You know, they're always giving passes to their buddies, you know, and, and nobody can ever park downtown. It seems like a small issue, but it was important in that community. Uh, and because he, make an open, he made an open records request, he was able to expose that. We're gonna keep rolling. How much time do I have, like 10 minutes? Yeah. 
hometown? Um, you know, where does this person claim to come from? Um, you know, do they maybe play up that they came from, they were born in the ghetto and they had it hard and they had a single mother and they went to a terrible, you know, schools with bad public education. Um, and, and then you come to find out, you know, that they were really, you know, didn't have it quite as bad as they play up. And again, who cares? But if they're claiming, if they're playing that up to advance their political career, I think it's important for us to know. Um, Definitely. Hold on one second. The, um, the website that I've got up there, or click on hometown. So the U.S. Census Bureau has something called the American Fact Finder, and I always wondered, like, what does the U.S. Census Bureau actually do? Like, I mean, I know they count us, and I know they keep track of numbers and statistics, but I always kind of thought, eh, what do they really have valuable to offer to me? And so this... American Fact Finder, oh, actually, it's not displaying, but you can find it if you Google it. Um, it's really cool. You can search by, like, county and by dates, and you can go and find out um, very specific information about a community. You can find out what the, um, the average annual income was in that community. You can find out crime statistics on that community, and you can do it by date. So maybe you guys are interested in find out what Boca Raton was like 10 years ago and what it's like today. That would make a really good comparative news story, I think. Here's where we were 10 years ago, and here's where we are today, and why are businesses leaving the state, and why have crime statistics gone up? And I think that's a really great news story idea, is to use American Fact Finder and, and research communities. Next. We'll just keep rolling. Oh my goodness, we probably don't have time to go through all of, but where do they get their funding? Um, when there's a particular candidate or an organization or someone who you know uh, is rolling out the big bucks, you wanna ask yourself, A, how are they acquiring their wealth? You know, Is it family money? If so, you wanna research the family. You know, Did they earn their own money? If so, through what type of a business or what type of an industry? Um, how do they spend their money, tax dollars? Uh, you definitely, people who have already ser previously served in office, you want to find out how they spent taxpayer dollars. Um, so we won't go to all these, but opensecrets.org was mentioned earlier today. That will give you federal campaign finance reports, which is really fun to look into. Um, if you go to followthemoney.org, that will give you kind of like salaries, and, and or that's um, state reports, I'm sorry, that's state reports. Um, we won't go into that. So if you wanted to go into the state of Florida and, and, um, and look up um, state politics and how candidates or how they were receiving money, uh, followthemoney.org is a great website. And then the third that we have on there is Legistorm. And that will give you uh, like foreign travel reports by members of Congress. Uh, it will tell you like how they're spending their money on, on some of their travel, their personal use of travel. So that's another good one. I'm sorry that we don't have time to like click through. Normally I like to actually click on Florida and show you the contributors and kind of give you a little taste there. Next. So I won't beat a dead horse with the, with the open records, but you know this is the part where I just reiterate that um, all this information is available to you if you make the request. Just a few, um, a few examples to get you thinking. You can request a copy of the governor's schedule find out what the governor's doing on a regular basis, who is he visiting, um, and that might open up more questions as to why is he spending money on certain things. You can ask for emails and, and phone calls on a specific topic from a specific person. So, you know, when someone is a, uh, you know, is a, in office already, not a candidate, you know, there are certain times when you can ask for their emails and phone calls uh, and, and a log, a record log. And then the other thing would be the White House visitor record, which we already talked about. Last one, click on the, oh wait, go back. That's okay. And then click on the little <laughs> detective, Sherlock, whoever that is. <laughs> so um, Reporter's Desktop has this great compilation and it's called Who is John Doe? And it, this is great. If you don't write down any website, you definitely want to remember Who is John Doe by the Reporter's Desktop. And here it has questions. John Doe lived in a different place with different people, and it shows you all the links and where you can go to find that information. Keep scrolling. He was involved in a lawsuit. 
Um, he bought or sold real estate. He, keep going, keep going. Um, he is a doctor, and it shows you where to go to look up his medical license. He is a lawyer, shows you where to go um, to, you know, to see the State Bar Association and how you can look up his, his records there. Um, keep scrolling. Is he a politician? Scroll, scroll, scroll. And there's a whole world of information there for you. Um, anyways, this can get you lost on several rabbit holes, but I think it's a good place to start if you're looking for more information. Is it just it's, what's the URL there? It's reporter.org, desktop, tips, John Doe. If you just Google reporter's desktop and who is John Doe, it'll pop up for you. And I'm trying to think. The reporter's, is it on the back here? Yeah, reporter's desktop is, is in your Citizen Watchdog book on that back page there, so it's there for you. So I've given you a lot to think about. I hope I haven't rambled on too much. I'll take a few questions, and it's 5 o'clock, so for me that means it's margarita time. But <laughs> it's been a long day. Question in the front. I heard that Obama was meeting outside the White House. I noticed Obama was meeting coffee shop. Oh, see, that's interesting. That would not, if you asked for the White House visitor logs, that would not be included. But I already like the way you're thinking. See, not accepting the narrative, thinking outside the box. How, if I were a politician, how would I try to get around this? Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, obviously, um, they have loopholes. They have, you know, national security is a reason that's used all the time to deny us information. But what they can help is if you create public pressure. Like if you on Twitter start talking about or on, on in using social media, you start asking a question, I heard that Obama met with this person in a coffee house, you know, we didn't, you know, why is he meeting with him? And you create a buzz on social media, it will become a news story. So you certainly have that power of at least, even if you don't know the answer, you have the power to ignite that question in the hearts and minds of other citizens and to make them think um, pretty, pretty strongly about it. I believe that the BlackBerry that President Obama has <coughs> is to his private account. Though the early on there was an issue as to giving him the security for the use of that BlackBerry. So he's got a White House account and he's got a mm. private account. It's probably very true. I mean, when you're talking about the president, that's a little different. Um, at the local level and the county level, it would be easier to, to gain records from your, but at the presidential level, like again, they use national security my as a- point, My point is though, is that you could have your official you know, business or your government account. Yep. And you've got another, you have another account and you can be using a device you want to, and you don't have to provide those records. That's true. Any other questions? Thank you, everybody. Let's give a round of applause to all the speakers today.